So, so the next talk, um, so Natalia Bukharov uh, is senior scientist at Thomson Reuters, and today uh, she will present examples of how standards development is linking to recent advances in tools assisting transmart team with curation, QA, and the famous ETL process. Okay. Sorry. Did you say famous ETL process? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, we talk a lot about ETL process. Uh, different. You know. Thomson Reuters ETL or ETL all, in general? All. All. <laughs> all of the ETL process. Okay, so uh, the previous talk was about from a user perspective. My um, perspective is from a service provider. Service provider perspective on the Transmart data curation and data loading. So uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the molecular data standards development and we worked with Pfizer in the past few months to develop a standards to load the data to normalize the molecular data before we load them into Transmart. Um, so that the question is why we need to normalize them, what do we need to do with this data, how do we need to normalize them, and uh, we also develop stand standards for um, tree ontology, um, taxonomy kind of uh, data normalization and metadata, and I also will talk a little bit about the curation approaches, the ETL, automated curation, curation pipeline. Uh, so uh, with the um, molecular data standards, it kind of came out of necessity. Uh, I started to work with Pfizer a few months ago and we had this uh, a whole bunch of studies that we had to curate and we had to work with different teams and each study had molecular data in it and we would start, we would discuss it with the team, we would load the data according to the team uh, wishes, uh, to the specifications and uh, um, I would have my um, uh, kind of concerns that I would voice about the data being loaded but as a service provider I do want to please my customers so I push back but I, then I just go alone and then we will have another study we would uh, discuss the data then we would load the data and the, the next team would have a different approach to the data loading and uh, the global idea was to actually have all the data uh, accessible to all the scientists and to have them um, to be able to analyze this data uh, from different studies by scientists that are not working on those studies initially. So um, that kind of created a dilemma for us. We kept going back and re-uploading re re the data. The molecular data kept getting re-delivered to us to kind of streamline and to harmonize them with previous studies. So it, it just at some point um, um, we've decided that we just have to do something about it. So uh, we said to um, do some data normalization standards to set up. Some. So we started to think about what do we need to do? How do we need to pre-process the data before they can be loaded into Transmart? Uh, how do we need to design uh, the Transmart tree? Uh, what is gene expression data, what is protein assay data, what is metabolomics, what is flow cytometry. Flow cytometry was the most contentious discussions we had because some people were insisting that it's facts and others were saying no, that's all flow cytometry and, and we don't want any facts in the, our Transmart tree because it's very inaccurate. Um, so what do we need to uh, have in the Transmart tree to make uh, a person understand what data they are analyzing and what data do we need to include as a metadata in the browser interface into as a flat file. With this data then people that come and uh, to the Transmart two years from now they can still analyze this data, they can still understand what was, what was done with this data. Uh, so this is a workflow, this is how we really uh, said to do it. We have reviewed the, the data, we have uh, reviewed the data uh, examples in Transmart, we identify the inconsistency, we evaluated industry standards, we collected the gathered requirements from different stand 
uh, subject matter experts and from analysts. And then we, we had a number of different conversations. We, we had a draft. We, we, we had these conversations. And uh, we came up with some uh, sort of um, standards. So uh, that's my cat. And I love my cat. So uh, first of all, we had to decide uh, what what is how do we want to put the data into the tree. Uh, so we needed some kind of an ontology for different methods that I use to generate molecular data. So um, I have looked at the different ontologies that exist for data, for molecular data. And I came to the conclusion that they are taxonomies. So as far as my cat is concerned, he might be a tiger. But from my point of view, he is my pet. So he's in the pet ontology. So he's more related to pet. So taxonomies there have to they, um, deal with intrinsic properties of entities. And ontologies is about users. So we had to develop a specific ontology for Transmart that made sense for us as a user to organize all of the molecular data in a way that would make it easy for people to find so they know where the data, they know what this data are. So the first uh, order of business was uh, how, what do we put in the biomarker data and what stays in clinical data. So that was, um, uh, we had a discussion and uh, we kind of came to the conclusion pretty quickly on that. So all the data now in, in Pfizer trees, they're organized in a consistent manner, well, at least the one that we are creating. So we have uh, the data uh, that were generated in the controlled GLP environment, even if it's a molecular data, they are still in the clinical data folder. Sometimes we would put them in both folders, in the biomarker and clinical data. All the data that were generated in explore, for exploratory purposes and not GLP controlled, they are in biomarker data. It can be high dimensional data or low dimensional data, but they were generated for biomarker um, research, so they are in the biomarker folder. So the next order of business was to organize the tree, because when we first started uh, looking at this tree, looking at the different examples, like a lot of data looked like that. And this is actually ELISA. So it's not immunophenotyping, it's just an ELISA. So some of the data that were loaded into Transmart tree, uh, some of the data owners felt like they have to reflect the whole protocol like step by step, and the trees were really deep. You would start with the samples that were collected and how they were incubated and all the way to the point of uh, analyzing them. At the end of it all, you don't really know what technology was used to analyze the data. So what we did is we um, developed, come on back, okay. Uh, so we, we just developed the um, trees for um, all of the different data types that are consistent with the really original gene expression data that was kind of developed. It's in the very first manual um, by recombinant. Uh, I think they had a, a, a good approach to it, and there is no point of reinventing the wheel. It works. I think we can just keep reusing it. So um, the way we are putting this tree together, we have uh, the type of data that it's going to go in here. And then we have a Transmart platform. It's not the platform. Um, it kind of makes sense for uh, gene expression arrays. But in Transmart, you do have to load tra platform with HDD data. So we went with the platform as well. So uh, here, platform for this protein assay, it has uh, the manufacturer, which is mesoscale discovery, and the assay type. And then we have a tissue type, which is a mesh term. If there is no mesh term, we've agreed to, we're going to use MEDRA, because in some cases, like PBMC, there is no mesh term for PBMC, but it's uh, used in different assay very often. And then we have, um, for protein assay, you have to, to have like a, a, a inhibitor or stimulant, and then you have your data. And we also have uh, rules where we put the visit name and, and where we put the normalization. And this is RNA-seq data. 
for the RNA-seq data, it was decided that the data must be loaded with the original gene assembly platform that was used for the original data analysis. And when I thought this is the basically the gene assembly that was used for this RNA-seq data. Okay, so the, the next is, uh, we also had a number of conversations uh, about what is what, especially the flow cytometry, as I mentioned, was really content, contentious. So you had to define what is what. So uh, and the um, data standards have a definition for all of the different assays that will go under different folders, so you know where to look for them. So what is protein assay? We were discussing like proteomics, uh, protein quantitation, the, again, the kind of um, a common uh, agreement was just to call everything protein assay. So what is protein assay? It's a, it's a target-specific protein detection and quantification by, and there is a number of different assay that can be used, and uh, we've listed some examples, but it, it's not limited to these examples. And uh, the protein assay would also include any um, protein modification, quantification of protein modified, uh, of modified proteins. So the uh, flow cytometry, like I said, it was contentious, so we, we have agreed that flow cytometry is, is any assay that measures uh, cell subtypes uh, within a mixture of cells using cell um, markers, and also assay that use the flow cytometry methods to measure uh, proteins within the cells, but within the specific cells, like a single cell um, signaling uh, profiling nodality. So we had this nodality provider assays that I use flow cytometry, but they measure cells with uh, proteins within the cells. What is not, we also defined what is not going to be under flow, flow cytometry. It's any method that is using flow cytometry, but not to uh, measure the cells within the cell population, but to use it as a method, for example, a FRAT assay can be run as a flow cytometry, in a flow cytometry way, but it is going to be protein-protein interaction, so it's not about measuring the cells. So, and we have defined all of the different type of assay and which goes where. Uh, so the, then there was a normalization. So the, uh, the most challenges we had with the qPCR data, because when we are loading this data, we, as some uh, uh, study owners would provide us with CT values, some with DCT, some provide us with delta delta CT values, some are inverted CT DCT values, some are scaled. Uh, so we had all sorts of different methods and and different values, and the most um, I think a dangerous thing about it is that they were not defined anywhere. You just see the values and you don't really know whether it's a CT or, well, you can look in its values if you run the qPCR, you can tell CT from DCT, but if you are looking at the scaled inverted DCT, you cannot really tell whether it's DCT or CT. So anyway, so we had uh, um, some discussions about it, and I think uh, this data have been renormalized about 10 times, and we have reloaded it 10 times because they kept just taking them back from us and having more discussions and renormalizing, re re but I think right now we're in a good shape. It might be a little bit more, uh, uh, it might be Pfizer-specific a little bit, but um, I think the general idea is, is applicable to any data. So what Pfizer does with the data, they um, analyze them as inverted scaled DCT, so they become a, a kind of similar to the analysis that you would do for the same data if they were expression values. So for uh, people who don't really run qPCR, um, it, it's really challenging for a fresh person data type to understand. You have to invert them and you kind of have to look at them upside down all the time because what is high is actually low and what is low is actually high. So that's why inverted scale DCT, what was decided to make it easier for confused people when they are looking at this data to not get lost with them. And, and, and uh, this data were also now being normalized the same way as RNA-seq. So all the values um, that are um, 
zero by the qPCR standards. Uh, if it's more than 50% samples, they are removed. The genes are removed, and if it's if it's uh, uh, missing values, they are replaced with zeros. In in in, in um, RNA seq, these values are replaced with low numbers. So everything has been uh, kind of normalized in the same way. Um, so another thing that we, we have done, um, and this was mostly done by uh, subject matter experts, uh, uh, they have developed uh, templates. Uh, so these are templates, these templates are now our, each study owner who wants to submit their data to Transmart, they have to fill out these templates. What these templates, it's a metadata. What these templates have, they have all the essential information that one would need to reanalyze this data. In, in, in the future, in several years from now. And it also contains all the data that we would like to reflect in the Transmart tree. So the tissue type, the platform, the manufacturer, the normalization um, type. So uh, for every data type, uh, this, this has been developed and it, it is a kind of streamlined and uh, harmonized between different data types. Uh, so I think, um, and this, this is going to make life um, easier for uh, future curators. So, and I would like to acknowledge all these people at Pfizer uh, that um, we had all the long conversations about uh, the different methods of, of normalization and the data, what would be appropriate and what would not be appropriate for Transmart. So, that was a, a very important conversation to have with the user because I, I mean, two types of analysts you know, for in using Transmart. Well, maybe considering to use Transmart to, to um, biologists and uh, um, clinical scientists, and they often overestimate Transmart. They want low draw data, and they think that Transmart will do everything for them. And then there are analysts that really underestimate Transmart, are, are very skeptical about what Transmart can do and very dismissive of it. And I think um, it's kind of educating people what Transmart is good for and how do you need to use it uh, and it would, um, would improve um, the use of Transmart and uh, the the kind of the way people see the transmart from both ways, from analyst perspective and and from the user perspective. Okay, um, and this is my other um, part of my talk is about data curation approaches. Uh, we've talked about that as as being a, a challenge for transmart. Uh, so uh, we are service providers, so we do data curation day in and day out. So we have to develop some ways of dealing with different data types and um, to be more efficient and uh, to make sure that uh, we don't really introduce any artifacts when we are manipulating the data. So the data stays um, intact when it gets through the curation. So uh, we have uh, several different approaches. We have our flexible uh, ETL tool that allows us to um, load the data in a very flexible manner. We do develop automated curation pipelines. Uh, and that works very well when we have a long-term project and the data that comes to us is in, in the same format. And uh, it it needs the same output. So we have the same input, we have the same output, so we can develop a pipeline once and it will be just automatically curating the data. So for that we would usually have a subject matter expert, um, a curator doing the curation and then we have a developer uh, working with the curator for this pipeline. And then we also have a curation pipeline building blocks uh, that's when the data comes to us um, um, in a more or less stable format, but the output is still not stable. We don't not really know what the customer will want in a, in a year from now. And then um, we've also done some curation user interface development. Uh, so um, ETL tool, 
I've never used any other tools. All, all I know is um, <coughs> Thomson Reuters ETL tool, but I love it. It's the best thing after the sliced bread, I think. So what this tool can do, it allows us to map data for loading directly from the source files without the need to split, pivot, and it saves time and assures data integrity. Because that's when you have to parse your data into separate tables, that's when you, things can happen. Then you have to make sure that you can see it really well. But uh, um, my personal philosophy is don't mess with data unless you necessarily have to try to load them in the format that you get them as much as possible. So, and to do that, we have developed some additional special labels. So, the uh, original loading procedure had the data label, visit name, data values that could be used. We developed multiple data labels that we can use in the category CD. And you can also develop some other approaches uh, with Transmart. Manual is available, and we always anything we develop, it becomes instantly available. We deposit a new copy all the time. So the flexible tool for people who does not create the data that may not seem like much, but it is a really great improvement. So the multiple label. Here is an example of the really, really long table where we have all these different variables um, and multiple uh, patients, um, multiple patient records in a very, very long table. And we can only load one record per patient per category CD. So in order to do that, uh, for this table, we just um, so we use this multiple label. So you can see that we are using the the score, the Maya score, but a different Maya scores in, in this column, and then we have dates in this column, different dates, and we have periods of this um, in this column, and then the score type, and this is the actual values that we need to load, and we need to load them in this tree. So it goes like that. We use the label, one label from a MAYA score, and then we use the score type label, and then we use the data label, which is this label, and then we use the face label, and then we use the visit name. So basically, we don't really have to break it into multiple columns. We just can load it from the original data column. OK, that's it. Uh, few more examples of the flexible ETL tool. Um, and here, another um, option um, that we have in our ETL tool is, is a terminator. We often get these tables where um, we have visit names and values for different visits, for different tissue types, and that all can be kind of mapped out in a category CD. But then there will be one column where uh, there is just one value per patient, regardless of visits, regardless of tissues, regardless of drug. It, it could be like how the temperature was measured. It was measured on many different days. It was measured on many different time points, but it was always oral. So you don't really have to load all of that. But you cannot really load this from here because uh, you have to have one value per patient. So we have a terminator tag. So with this terminator tag at the end of the category CD, will, it will just take just one value per patient from this column loaded and will ignore the visits and will ignore all of the other values, unless the visit is in a category CD or any other of the labels in the category CD. So that also saves a lot of time because alternatively, we would need to parse it out remove the duplicates and load it from a different column. OK. So automated creation and uploading pipeline, as I mentioned, um, that works really well if you have a stable input and stable output for your data. It requires initial investment of time. Uh, so first, you have to really review your data. You have to curate them, and then based on the curation than working with an IT person to develop uh, the curation pipeline. And then you have to QC it and test it. And But once it's done, it, it's pretty much uh, automated. And uh, these slides, I think, um, 
most people might have seen them already somewhere because we presented them before. So this one is a, is a five-year co collaboration that we have with One Mind, and uh, this is a fully automated tool. So we have the data uh, that are being pulled in, they are automatically transformed. There is a QC summary statistics report that is then being correct compared to the original data. Uh, there is a cross-validation uh, plugin in the Transmart that also does some summary statistics, and then uh, the data is being delivered on, on, on a periodic basis, and it, it goes through this pipeline, goes through the validation, and it gets loaded. So another example of this is uh, the um, another uh, work that we've been doing with um, Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, we have created the ADNI study, the LARC2 study in this, in this manner, also through regular updates and uh, uh, automated curation and then validation of the data. So, and, and in addition to these studies, we've created some of the other studies in the same manner. So what I need to add here too is that all these automated pipelines, they do allow for uh, modification when you need to. You just go into script and modify whatever you need to modify. And then they also allow for downloading uh, the curated data and then curated them further because that's also sometimes is necessary because uh, um, we create data that have um, like doctor notes and I don't really think you can really develop an automated way of curating misspellings of every different way of misspelling and abbreviation unless you can kind of reverse engineer a physician's mind into the curation pipeline. So in some cases we would download data back and clean up them further, uh, um, kind of cleaning up and normalizing some of the uh, notes. Uh, okay, building blocks. So this works well for um, uh, more or less stable input data when you don't really know um, what the output is going to be. And uh, the building blocks also do not really require uh, an IT person. So they will have been already created and uh, they can be used by curators. Uh, curators can be trained to use these blocks and, um, and they address most common uh, transformations that are needed for the data when we curate them. So there are blocks that translate values, there are blocks that calculate, make new columns, transform values using regular expressions, apply normalization, scale, scale and replicate columns if needed, um, do some conversion. Uh, okay. Um, and this is an example of uh, uh, this, uh, how it, where do we use it? So we have this um, collaboration, um, well, we support the collaboration between LIBOR and Janssen, and uh, uh, they collaborate on the um, mental disorder. So they have one installation of Transmart. Uh, the data comes to us from the LIBOR Institute and from Janssen. Uh, we curate the data, we load it into Transmart, and scientists then from uh, LIBOR Institute and from Janssen can access this data and analyze. So the data that we got, uh, the clinical data, it's output of the red cap and um, other molecular data, they are generated by different methods um, by scientists at, at the LIBOR and, and Janssen. Okay. So this is, this is how it actually works. Um, so there is a, a master script, which is a curator toolbox. And then the master script takes the curation pipeline. And uh, it, it takes the, uh, the data. So this is the data update. And then it takes the curation pipeline. And then it gives an output of the curated data. And the pipeline is a text file that put put together, that these blocks are stitched together, and uh, the blocks do the transformation that you know that you need to do. You just stitch them one, at, uh, one by one. So the first block removes all of the NAs because they are uh, the output of the, um, of the red cap inserts NAs. 
And the, this uh, block is called translate. So the translate block can take as an input, it can take uh, it can take column numbers, column uh, range, multiple column range, and then another input can be from two. It can be dictionary from two, or it can be dictionary with column numbers and from two. So in, in this case, it's a simple translate. We want to replace all the NA with now, just remove all the NA. Then the next one is uh, another translate uh, block that will apply the dictionary. So in the dictionary, uh, that's how it looks. Uh, in some cases, we can use either dictionary uh, that has column numbers and the translation, and or we can, if it, if it's all the translation is the same for the range, we just use from two. And for this particular project, uh, it's important because we have 2,500 uh, variables, and I think 1,500 of them have to be translated. They have some codes that have to be translated into the categorical value. So that, that is translated, and, and then that's not the whole pipeline, but it's, it's just um, a kind of examples of the blocks that are being used. So the next block duplicates columns. So these columns, 195 to 100, and this one, they have records of current medications. Each patient has several columns for current medications. So we duplicate them because we want to keep the original record. We just want to manipulate or translate uh, the copies of this record. So we apply drug type dictionary to this. So we, um, the putting the dictionary together is still a manual um, task. Uh, so and uh, then another block is uh, merge. So in this block, we merge the columns together because the output has race in seven different columns. And it has also many different uh, variables um, as a check mark marks. So you have, you have to pull it together. So the race has seven columns, and, and we just merge it. And what, what this does, it merges it, it calculates new columns, and then it moves it to the very back. <coughs> As an output, it takes what to join the column, and then it takes the new column name uh, that's going to be created. And then we take this new column name, and we use another translate function that translates the regular expression into uh, um, whatever we want to translate. In this case, we had some patient that uh, selected more than one race. So when we have more than one race, we translate it into mix. Okay, and uh, this is just some examples of an output. Uh, that's what we start with. That's what we get after we do the translation, and this is how the tree looks after that. So what we do here, you, this is an example. We put the seven race columns. Uh, we translate the columns. We put um, pull them into one. Uh, more than one race was re replaced with mixed. So you have here all the different traces. Uh, there was also um, other description race, so we kept that. And here, so we have the race. This is a mixed race, and we had the they kept kept the description. So if you want to look, I think I, I remove all of the. I just left the mix later. So if you want to look what this mixed was, you can look. It was Native American and, and white. So we keep all the original data, and we also have the pool data that can be then used for, for analysis. Okay. Time is over. Oh, okay, so um, uh, it's another example. Um, interface, I just have two more slides. So this is an interface. It's also a, it's a, an interface for, for these curation blocks. So uh, we found it to be useless whatsoever. So we, we've tried it. So it works uh, well. Um, it, it works well with for the small da data, uh, um, but we almost never get the small data. We always either have a really complex data or um, a huge data type. So it, 
does not do us any good, but it, it can be done in this environment, just picking up. Um, and this is another example with Michael J. Fox. Uh, there is a plugin that we have created, it's a curation plugin in, in the Transmart uh, with the creation script and some, met, some options to um, modify the script and select other options to translate or um, do some other transformation to the data as needed. Okay, um, that was my last slide. Uh, so. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we have time for one or two questions. Um, so, in the course of this conference, I mean, we've talked a lot about the, the various difficulties of uploading data, and I think, you know, my first focus was on just the mechanical difficulties, right? The, the programs, the fact that there's a lot of choices and it's not quite clear which one to use and how to get it set up and that sort of thing. So if, let's suppose we get over that hump and we make that easy and facile for, for new users and that sort of thing. Now you're faced with this problem, right? That there are different ways to load the same data set and they're all technically correct, but some are gonna be better than others, you know, as to how you organize it in that tree. Um, how good are we at sharing the knowledge that's that you learn across multiple clients so that the rest of the, the community has an example to follow so that they don't end up loading data 10 times to kind of get it right? I mean, you mentioned that as, a, as something that happens and it would be nice to sort of uh, help, help the rest of the community avoid that problem. Um, I think it would be nice uh, if molecular data standards were shared. So Jay, Bergeron is here, you can ask him if they're willing to share it. I think it, there might be some specifics for uh, Pfizer there, but they are really just general, general uh, common sense kind of uh, approaches to data normalization. Um, when people ask me what to do with the data before you load them into Transmart, I usually say that you have to do whatever you do with your data before you do ANOVA, just to make sure that they're in that shape, and then you can load them. Um, so the common sense data normalization, we, we have developed, I think they're applicable to all of the other people uh, that load data, molecular data into Transmark. Uh, also, I have to say that I have, normal, uh, have analyzed some very questionable um, data without any normalization and I was still getting results that are making sense. So it's kind of a, a, a tribute to the robustness of some of their um, workflows um, in, in there. Um, but I, I think it has to be, uh, we do need to have standards because Transmart is, is an exploratory tool for people who are not analysts and they may not realize that there is some pre-normalization is required for this data. So it has to be described somewhere and, and made clear to the users. Uh, guess that's um, generating misleading results is not gonna get us anywhere. Uh, other the trees, uh, the trees, it's a different issue is how you design the trees. Uh, Pfizer has a very good uh, rule books on how they design the trees for the clinical trials. And it, it makes sense for uh, when we design, go, uh, discuss the trees with Pfizer and we, we put it for the clinical trial, we go by the protocol also. Uh, so we organize adverse events by the protocol, we organize uh, the endpoints by the protocol. So that's applicable to clinical trial data. And I think if they're willing to share it, that also would be uh, a really good uh, guidance for other people. Uh, on the other hand, there are other studies like this LIBOR Janssen studies. I, I'm organizing them in an uh, unconventional way because they have so many variables, they're unlikely to use them all. And I have to make sure that I pull out the ones that I might be used to the top. And uh, we've been collaborating on this project about a year now. And I don't think we still have our tree in, in place because as they're going to go through the data and analyze them, we were going to. Uh, most likely resort uh, 
these variables and put them into different folders to give them access. And I have some really questionable folders there as well because as data being gen generated, not all of the data is available. So I have folders like um, uh, diagnosis for mRNA diagnosis for autoantibodies. So these patients had some diagnosis when these assays were done, but they don't really have a, a actual diagnosis output from the red cap. So you have to have something there for, to, to do some preliminary analysis. So it's a questionable tree design at this point, but we are working on it. Uh, okay. Th thank you, Natalia. Perhaps one just last question. I'm Dirk Bornemeyer from AbbVie, and I was somewhat outspoken in the content meeting about some challenges we've had with TM Data Loader. So I wanted to first thank you for highlighting some of the features of TM Data Loader that actually make it very special and unique and, and some of the positives of it. Um, I was wondering if you have a generic solution for some of the fields that are not allowed to be null, especially the numeric fields, so like age and things like this. No, um, age can be null. Age can it be will be. It will be just um, okay. unknown in summary statistics. Okay. Then that turns it into a string field? Um, when it's null, no, it just doesn't load. You don't have to put unknown in there as a string. No, no. Okay, you, it, it, uh, summary statistics will just look at it. There is nothing value. I've had it, some people tell me that it could not be null, and they were having to put in bogus values in there. No, you don't have to do it. Even if you don't have any, some, uh, any age, sex, okay. race, it, you. you will still just get all unknown in your summary statistics. Thank and you. That's all. Thank you, Natalia. So uh, 